Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. This week I'm delighted to welcome a return guest host, Dr. Brian Caruana, to the Classical Ideas host seat. It thrills me to no end to collaborate again with Brian after his first appearance interviewing Dr. Dominic Schaefer on episode 191, and it's such a pleasure to have him back for episode 206. Brian's guest is Dr. Tanya Lerman, an anthropologist who studies the mind and whose Princeton University Press book, How God Becomes Real, Kindling the Presence of Invisible Others, was described by Mark Knoll as, quote, beautifully accessible, intellectually humble, and genuinely objective. Dr. Tanya Lerman is the Watkins University professor in the Stanford Anthropology Department. She is a medical and psychological anthropologist and also an anthropologist of religion. Dr. Brian Caruana has a PhD in religion, a business degree, and worked as a strategy consultant. He is the executive director of Encountering World Religions, where he has been teaching people about ethno-religious communities and facilitating actual encounters for 20 years. Please enjoy their conversation here on the Classical Ideas Podcast. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Caruana. I'm honored to be here at the invitation of Greg to step in for him on his wonderful podcast. Uh, just to introduce me, I, to introduce myself, I have a PhD from the University of Toronto in religion, and I'm the executive director of Encounter World Religions uh, in Toronto. Uh, Encounter uh, teaches about religious literacy. So I teach in schools, but I also teach uh, police officers and healthcare workers. Uh, HR professionals and businesses about religious literacy and inclusion in in the work environment and dealing with the public. Uh, We have classes online. Uh, The thing that might interest you the most, though, is when COVID's over, we will resume our discovery weeks. And uh, every year we have a discovery week where in Toronto people come and in one week we explore 11 religions with uh, introductory classes and 20 site visits. Uh, The BBC described Toronto as the world's most diverse city, and there are very large houses of worship, as well as wonderful small communities of Zoroastrians and Wiccans and Rastas uh, that we're all able to to visit. So you can check that at Encounter World Religions, uh, or you can look me up at my personal website, which is uh, religionsgeek.com, where I blog on all matters religions uh, once a week. I'm here today with Dr. Tanya Lerman. Uh, Dr. Lerman is a professor of religion at Stanford, Uh, She is uh, a scholar who is uh, a very unique scholar. I I have my own PhD and, and, you know, I probably read a couple hundred books and her work was so unusual. She is an anthropologist of the mind. Uh, That is, her work uh, is at the intersection of anthropology and psychology. And and I just found her books were unlike anything else I'd read. And I'm really excited to uh, talk uh, with you uh, today, Dr. Lerman. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Tanya, you're a you mentioned when you're doing your PhD, you are studying uh, a, pay, a neo-pagan group in Britain, and you are engaging in practices with them. And then one day you wake up and at your window, you see six druids. Uh, can you tell us what, what kind of practices were you engaging in and, and how did you come to see druids? So I describe these practices now as inner sense cultivation. Uh, Sometimes people talk about them as mental imagery cultivation. In the world that I, in the pagan world that I joined, they use the word pathworking. And so these are a kind of practice. You find them very, very widely in faith. Um, But in the pagan world, people are given explicit instructions to shut their minds, sorry, to shut their eyes, to, and see in their mind eye and to hear in their mind eye, and to smell in their, with their mind's nose, you know, to use all of their inner senses to experience some story. So the story will be something like, um, you know, we gather at the edge of a, of a, of a river. You see before you a, a, a boat. We climb into the boat, it magically expands so that we're all, you know, whoever is leading the story, there's, they're they're talking about the whole room. All of us fit into the boat. Um, Run your, as we push off from the shore, run your fingers through the water 
and feel the coolness of the water. Listen, listen to the birds sing in the trees. Feel the breeze on your cheeks. And you know, you 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 float down the river, you pull up against the bank of a, a you know, against the river bank, um, at the foot of a hill. The, you walk up the hill, and the narrator will say things like, Here the rocks crunch under your the, the, the small rocks crunch under your feet. You know, see the breeze ruffle the leaves in the trees, listen for the birds, smell the, the scent of the, the summer flowers. You know, doing this, always doing this kind of inner description. And you walk up the, the hill and at the top of the hill, there is a, some kind of temple. And, you know, typically the path working has you do an encounter so you come, we, you know, we come to the edge of the temple and we see before us the virgin guardian of the temple and notice the, the folds of her robes, the, the flower in her hair, the, the clarity of her gaze. She talks to you and she gives you something which you take in your hand and hold close to your chest. Feel the power of that item as it enters your body and becomes part of you. And then, so they'll, you know, so there's some, often there's a kind of a moment of a, a pause in which there's some interaction that you're allowed to encourage to imagine. And then you reverse the process. You come back to, you know, come go back down the, the hill into the boat, back along the river and come out. And, you know, and then the, the narrator will say something like, now, um, you know, open your eyes and find yourself back in the room. So I did some version of that for, you know, for months. There was a, I was part of a, what was actually called a pagan pathfinders group, an exercise class. And this is, was for people who weren't, who could be a member of a group, but didn't need to be a member of a group, a kind of public facing practice. So the pagan pathfinders would be announced and the places where you announce those kinds of things. There was no internet at the time, but there were bookstores and magazines and whatever. And um, I had also joined a sort of secretive lodge and I had to do a nine month training class to join the lodge. And that involves such things as 15 minutes a day, every day, um, sitting in my room, shutting my eyes and imagining as vividly as I could leaving my body and going up to some place in the sky. And so I had to imagine going someplace where I then built a garden and I needed to build and there would be these instructions as you know the weeks went on, build an altar. What does the altar look like? How high is it? What, what color is it? Now, do you see a chalice? When you place your chalice on the altar. What, you know, is there water in the chalice? Is there wine in the chalice? Can you see it clearly with your eyes, except just your inner eyes? Can you, you know, now there should be an athame kind of a, a sort of a, a, one of these knives or often a you know, letter opener or a blunt knife that's sort of seen as kind of the, the symbol of your power in this kind of world. Place nathami. Um, I, mean, I guess they didn't use the word athame because they weren't pagans properly. But, you know, you, you, you built a garden, you spent time in the garden, you brought spirits, beings, gods, contacts would be the word they would use to the garden and you engaged with those contacts. Um, and so I did that like 15 minutes a day for months, months. And, and you mentioned in your, in your book that you start to notice that your, your senses, like even when you're not doing this, you just, you know, I don't know, walk in a class or whatever that, or going to the stores that, that your senses, your, your experience of life started to change in some ways. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, first of all, felt quite clearly that my inner mental imagery was sharper, that it was 
you know, and the words I used, is this entirely correct? This was my experience. I don't know if this is psychologically correct, but it's what I experienced. I experienced that my, the borders of my images had more duration, that the colors were more opaque and had also had more duration. Um, one of the things that you know, the, so these exercises are quite, you know, you'll find them in Tibetan Buddhism, you find them in Ignatian spirituality, you find them in different forms and, and many faiths. One of the things that is true of humans is that humans find it hard to represent faces. And mm -hmm. later, later on, I did similar kinds of exercises, understood theologically very differently in an evangelical group. And I remember a woman who said to me, I did these exercises because I couldn't see Jesus's face. And after doing these exercises, I could see his face. And so that's, that's very much a kind of mental imagery phenomenon. Humans find it difficult to, it's like, it's easier for people to represent shoulders, stance, bodies, than faces and eyes. And I thought I got better at doing faces and eyes. Um, and then, you know, all sorts of other changes happened as well. I started feeling like, you know, they were like the everyday things were more connected, that there were fewer coincidences. There was more of what Jung would call syn synchronicity. Um, you know, so anyway, that was my, my, my experience that I began to change. And it was... In the spring, I mean, you know, my work talks about the relationship between these practices and spiritual experience. I, I don't want to give the impression, I, I think there are two things that are true. There are certain people who are more likely to have um, sort of unusual experiences, of the kind people often deem spiritual. I think it's also true that if you do these practices, you're more likely to have those experiences. So it was, I'd started doing these practices in maybe the summer. And I think it was May of the next year that I had this experience of the Druids. So this is a long answer to your question, but I had this That's experience good. of reading a book by sort of a member of this world, Marion Zimmer Bradley, who's often described as somebody who's a pagan or a witch. And she wrote this book on the Arthurian romance. So Merlin and uh, Guinevere and Arthur and um, uh, Morgaine, who's kind of an interstitial witchy character and who, who's the hero of this book or the heroine. And um, it's a book about Britain between the time of the, the Celtic dominance with these priests we call Druids and, uh, and Christianity. Anyway, so I was deep into this book and I was trying to just to read it as an experience, the way I read books as a kid. And early one morning I woke up and I saw these Druids kind of standing by the window. I would call it psychologically, I would call it a hypnopompic experience. We know these experiences are a little more common on the edge of sleep than they are, you know, three in the afternoon. Um, and but what was striking to me is that the experience was, um, it felt like a sensory experience. It felt like I saw the Druids with my eyes and it was really quite striking. I mean, I, I was quite impressed by the fact that people had these experiences. And they talk to me about these experiences. It's just, it's just that, you know, it captures your attention when you have one yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, and, and, you know, you, you mentioned, I like that you mentioned how, you know, a lot of these practices uh, transcend, um, you know, across many religious communities. You'll find them, in, as you say, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Catholic Ignatius spirituality. Uh, so in another part of your career, you start, um, investigating uh, vineyard Christian churches in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and, and again here, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the vineyard Christian church and how, how do they use this same sort of um, uh, imaginative work? 
So they would describe it a little differently. They might get a little anxious by the word imagination, sure. but they uh, and they have. Um, but they describe many of the same features of the practice. So there are books like Experiencing God or In God of Whispers, and you can even see this in The Purpose Driven Life, although it's a little more hidden. Mm. But the invitation is to experience God uh, very vividly. So this is a kind of faith in which God is understood to be, when you're really invited to experience God as a person among people. And people are very sophisticated about the fact that they understand that the more vividly you experience God, the more there's a kind of a humanness to the vehicle carrying this mighty, irreducible spiritual presence. Nevertheless, you know, the, the, you know, experiencing God will, will, you know, wants you to go for a walk with God. And, you know, sort of go for a walk with God and talk to God about, like, what's bothering, bothering you right now. And then, you know, they're a little more focused on God's voice than on God, what God looks like. Although they, you know, I did the Ignatian spiritual exercises in the vineyard church, mm. and there was plenty of visual stuff that they were trying to evoke. But, you know, people, the manuals will say things like, okay, so God's voice shows up in the normal stream of your consciousness. And you have to look for th things you might have taken to be thoughts that are sort of more spontaneous than the rest of your thoughts that somehow pop out, that somehow you know, also feel like the, they're the kind of thing that God would say, that feel like they're not in conflict with scripture. I mean, one pastor said to me, you know, if God, if you think that God is telling you to jump off a bridge, that's a mistake. That's not God. Um, but, but people will start, would talk to me about sitting on a bar, you know, a park bench, God's arm is around their shoulders. They're cuddling up to God and they're talking to God about their day and they're asking God about his day. So that's a kind of a step further than the God presented in the Hebrew Bible and even the God presented in the gospels. But they, you know, people will, people would talk to me about dancing with God in the living room. They would talk to me about having a cup of coffee with God. And, you know, when I, first I, I first became interested in this kind of faith because of when I was doing interviews and the woman said if you want to understand my God you need to have a cup of coffee with God and so I said like, what does that mean and she said well you know and you go to a coffee shop with a friend and you sit down and your friends across the table from you and you, you need to do that with God you know and sort of you know you need to imagine what God is look, looks like and what God is saying. And then you need to talk to God and hear what God says. And the pastor at this church that I joined in another part of the state said one morning, you want to get to know God, pour God a cup of coffee. And he said, take a real cup with real coffee. you got your cup with real coffee and you sit down with those two cups of coffee and you talk to God. So that's kind of the same thing. It's, you know, it's a little different from, you know, if you, the Ignatian spiritual exercises are actually really close to that exercise of going down the river and, you know, bumping Pagan up. Pagan one, yeah. It's very, very similar. Um, the evangelical ones are a little, a little looser, um, but it's still the same format and people are clearly using their inner senses and they're clearly having an effect. I mean. Yeah, I mean, what I found so interesting about your work was the idea that, um, you know, because we often think, well, people interpret their experiences differently, but but you point out that by engaging in these practices, by attending to their mind, by going through exercises, it's not just that they in interpret their experiences differently, you start to have different experiences as, as, as happened to you, essentially, right? It, it right. You actually change the world you're encountering, essentially. Yes. And I think that that's a really important point. So people start to feel God's presence more. And that happens in little ways. 
so that people will say, oh, and they'll learn to experience God speaking to them. So they'll come to the, and what they mean by that is they know how to pick out those thoughts in their minds that are, that they're going to say are God's speaking to them. And they say things like, well, I recognize God's voice the way I recognize my mom's voice on the phone. And they like, they're, they clearly learn to do that. They start, this one woman I described, she started having, um, you know, vivid mental images. She said that sometimes it was like PowerPoint. People start to feel um, presences. So they feel people sometimes say, and people often say, God is present. And they have, mean by that, that they have a feeling that another person is present. Sometimes they say, I know exactly where, where in the room God is sitting. I can't see him. I can't hear him, but I just, and I know exactly where. Like it's a very localized sense of presence. Sometimes there are these really big experiences or, or, or more rare experiences. So, you know, uh, you, somebody has the experience of God talking out loud to them and they, you know, they turn their, you know, and, and I'll say to them, did you turn your head to see who was speaking? Oh, yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, and I couldn't see anyone. But they sort of like, like, and they like this. The woman I'm thinking of said, "Yes, I turned my head, and I knew it was God." And you know, and when they report those experiences, they often have a certain common form. It's not like God talks paragraphs. God has little clipped, short phrases that he that are spoken out loud. Those that experience is a little more common, I think, when somebody's in a car. Uh, or, or in a bus, C.S. Lewis was saved in a bus. We don't know if that's an auditory experience, but we do. You know, so there's something about, you know, there's a, there, there's a human body interacting with these, whatever else is going on. And the human body is more likely to have auditory events with like this kind of background ambient noise. Um, people see things. People feel God's hand on their shoulder and they say they have a very, like, it doesn't feel like a metaphor. They really feel God's hand. Um, they sometimes, you know, feel the Holy Spirit moving through them. If, if, that, if they cultivate that sense, that can happen more often. Um, they, you know, if they're, they're kind of open to being a vehicle for the Holy Spirit, they're, they'll feel this, 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 almost this electrical power move through them and then the, their hands will get hot. Um, they'll feel the, the power moving out of the hands. You know, people sometimes have these pretty rare, but quite often quite compelling experiences of being, you know, overwhelmed by light and love and peace and, you know, the kind of thing that William James called the mystical experience. Right. Um, and, you know, what exactly are those things? Is it one thing? Is it many things? I don't think we know. But these are moments, I mean, the, the strongest examples of mystical experiences came to me from my pagan interlocutors. So people would say, um, like I remember a man who said, that you know, he was putting his kid to bed and he, and he did this kind of cross level um, kind of confusion. He said, I wonder whether God loves me the way I love my kid. Mm. And he did had exactly this William James experience. He had a 90 second experience in which he felt more himself than ever before and not himself at all as if he was just one with the world. He knew that he was immortal. He absolutely knew that he was immortal. He um, felt fantastic. He felt um, he, did he lost any need for sleep. So he had this intense experience, no need for sleep, sat down on the bed and just stared out at the window for another six to nine hours. Um, just you know, and those I've heard someone else from that from that domain give me an experience like that. 
you know, it's interesting. I was thinking of like, um, you know, we think of the, um, the, the differences in society, people who are not religious talking to those who are religious or the culture wars that uh, what we have here is not merely a difference in beliefs, but, but that some of the gap is literally people are just experiencing different lives in different worlds, yeah. essentially. Yes. Uh, you talk about, um, uh, you've talked here about the kind of um, uh, the practices, uh, you know, the effort, the, there's a work going on here. Um, mm -hmm. And I think even some of the people you're interviewing say, yes, you know, this is something you have to work at, like learning mm -hmm. to play the piano or something like that, or like any other skill. Uh, but like any skill, uh, you say that there are two components here. There's training, mm -hmm. but there's also talent. And can you talk mm -hmm. about how did you get at this? You had this question, is there a talent component? And I think you found a way to kind of get to that. And can, can you talk about how you sort of, a, what, what tool you use to sort of figure that component out? So that's a great question. I, um, I actually had, was part of a group at the University of Chicago where I was the only anthropologist. And I got up one day and you know, it was a research group. And I said, oh, well, People say that some people are better at this than others, and that people who get better, who, who train, will get better. And it, you know, and my colleagues were sort of like, "Sure." <laughs> and, uh, and so I decided that I was going to see if I could get evidence that they would believe was evidence that there was something going on. So, I, so I asked around. Uh, my dad's a psychiatrist, and he suggested a couple of scales. And I started sitting down with members of this congregation and saying, tell me about your experience of God. And I started asking about these phrases that people I'd come across that people had been talking about. And at the end, I gave them these scales. And some of the scales they thought made them feel like I thought they were crazy. And some of the scales they answered exactly the same. But there was this one scale that was really interesting, and it was it was called the absorption scale, and it was devised as initially by um, Arky Telgen and I think David Atkinson as a uh, as, as a measure of hypnotizability. But it's not picking up. I mean, it correlates with hypnotizability, which is a funny thing, but it's it's not. It's different from that. It is. Um, it picks the questions like, sometimes I experience things the way I did as a child. If I want, I can turn noise into music by the way that I listen to it. Uh, sometimes the sound of a voice can be so fascinating, I feel I could listen forever. Um, for, you know, sometimes when, a, when a, um, I'm listening to watching a play, I forget that it's just a play and it feels like it's really happening. And so like 34 questions, only one of them has something to do with um, religion. And I noticed, first of all, I noticed that the woman that was like my example of a prayer warrior, somebody who was a really recognized as a really wonderful person of prayer and who had a lot of these vivid experiences, she read that scale and said, the man who wrote this scale lives inside my head. He knows my experience. Sure. And then there's another guy who like I knew had trouble with this, all of this practice. He said things like, I mean, I was once in a group with him and he asked us to pray for him, that he would hear God speak in a booming voice because God didn't talk to him. And I interviewed him, I gave him the scale, and he looked at he looked at the scale and he said, there are people who say yes. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's like, and, and so I was really intrigued and, 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 and I, e even in those initial interviews, I saw that this scale, you know, when people write true or yes, next to those, those, those items, the more trues or yeses, the more vividly they experience God as a person, the more spiritual experience they have, um, the, you know, the more they're likely to say they've heard God's voice or they've seen a vision. It's remarkably consistent. I can see this in undergraduates who aren't religious at all. 
I can see it in you know evangelicals. I saw it in, in multiple studies within evangelical Christians. We just did this study in which we were talking to Christians and non-Christians around the world. And even in translation, there's mm. something about this scale that really mm. predicts, to use that term, what people are experiencing. So what is the scale on about? So you could say, and it turns out this is a deep question. What is this proclivity? What's, what's, what, what is this scale capturing? I used to think that it just captured sort of sensory aliveness, you know, this willingness to experience your inner senses. And it definitely captures that. Mm-hmm. I, I'm beginning to think it, it, it captures a kind of a willingness to experience the world as alive mm. for want of a better term mm. as if there are uh, as if there's something vividly active about the world i'm beginning to wonder now with one of my colleagues whether um with kara weissman whether there's something that's like there's a childlike orientation to the world that is really key. And, and that's complicated because children are in some ways realists. Like, you know, Margaret Mead said, a child won't experience a, be- a bear under the bed unless the adult gives them the bear. And there's something yeah. really true about that. Yeah. But there's also something that we think is really basic in a child's sort of openness to experience and a willingness to explore. That's also really important. So there's something that this, there's something real about absorption. Mm -hmm. And is absorption like this capacity to engage with your senses? Is it a capacity just to focus? Is it an attitude towards the world? And you and you, you find that, right. So you can, whether it's your university students in your classroom or these subjects you're studying or folks in other countries, you can give them this test. And if they score high on it, they're also more likely to answer yes to, I hear the voice of God, or I see images or things of this nature. Is that right? right. And, and, it, and it's, uh, this test kind of proves stable over time. That is, it, it doesn't seem like it's learned. It's, it's a kind of ability test, essentially. I think so. I mean, it's a little complicated because I also want to say that people who are training are sort of training whatever this ability is. Right. And so there's there's a puzzle in absorption, just as there's a puzzle with hypnotizability. That and I, we don't understand this puzzle. Yeah. The puzzle is that if you give someone the absorption scale at time one, and then in this project that I did, we trained people for a month. They scored kind of the same on the absorption scale at the end. And, you know, Talikin, who the guy who really came up with the scale, he thought that this was a trait. It was not a measure of skill. So that's, and yet there's clearly people are changing and developing and sort of becoming more absorption-like. Hypnotizability has the same puzzle. So hypnotizability, there's a way of asking how deep can this person go into trance? And you can also, so that the, the, the hip, this hypnotizability test, that doesn't change over time. I see, but you can but, train them to, yeah. But you can train them to go deeper. So is it, so, so we're still trying to sort this thing. Out. Right. So yeah, in your book, you talk about these two components, that there's talent and then there's training. Um, And you started to allude there to the experiment you did. We've already talked about your personal experience uh, participating as an anthropologist in the neo-pagan group. And then then you have the survey questionnaires as you're studying the the vineyard Christians. But the third thing is you kind of put everything to the test with this iPod experiment that you designed to test both talent and training. Can you um, go into, what is the iPod experiment? I I think you have three groups in it. So how how does it work and what are the three groups? So the idea was, do these, can, can we, is there evidence that we can see with, you know, our incredibly clunky methods? So I'm not using fMRI imaging. I'm not putting anybody into a magnet. I just, you know, designed 
um, had 30 minute tracks for an iPod. And we um, got people into the, the, the into my office. We did these rich open-ended interviews. We um, gave them surveys, like a bunch of surveys, like these pen and paper things that you fill out. And we sat them in front of the computer and gave, gave them like different exercises that, you know, computer based exercises to look at the way people used and experienced mental imagery. And then when they walked out of the room, they had to pick out an, a brown envelope. And there were, in the brown envelope, there was an iPod. And they didn't know which of three conditions it had. It had either a inner sense cultivation track. So there are four tracks based on the Ignatian spiritual exercises in which you hear a piece of scripture and then you really walk into the scripture and you're asked to experience it as if in your, you're in a dream. And like one of the, one of them was about the 23rd Psalm, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you listen to the, you listen to the Psalm and then you re-experience this, this Psalm following the instructions with all your inner, in your senses. Look at the shepherd, look at the way he holds his, sh his shoulders. He turns around to you and walk, you follow him, listen to the birds in the trees, I mean, that kind of thing. And uh, so kind of loosely with the structure of vivid use of the inner senses, stop for interaction, imagined interaction. There's no nothing on the, on the track. Um, and then on another iPod, in another envelope, there are like 24 lectures from the teaching company on the gospels, really good lectures, you know, but very, you know, eggheady like lectures. This is, this is Matthew. This is what's going on with Mark. Uh, and then in another, we had, we offered this, this third, we had a third arm, but I, mostly it didn't enter into the, mostly didn't enter into the quantitative analysis because it was so tiny. Um, so it was more like a control really. Mm -hmm. And that was um, sort of um, what, what you'd call centering prayer. So it was like 30 minutes of um, pink noise. And you had instructions to sit there and think of nothing. You know, following the centering prayer instructions on the centering prayer site. So the rule was six days a week, half an hour a day for four weeks. And we brought people back in we asked them a bunch of questions, did these careful interviews. And the reason for the open-ended interviews was to really probe to see whether they'd had the experiences they were describing. Um, and then we gave them surveys, we sat them in front of the computer again, and we found, and there was this pretty consistent finding that in the, if they were in the prayer, if they were in the inner sense cultivation prayer condition, they were more likely to report that God had become more of a person for them, that they'd had more sense of God's presence. They reported more of these unusual sensory experiences. Mm. And so, and more of all kinds of experiences. So I think there's something real about this story of practice, that practice does change somebody. So at the beginning of the month, you're testing them on the absorption scale. You're having them sit at a computer and do a mental uh, imagery manipulation sort of test. You're mm -hmm. asking them, do you feel God? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you're putting them in three groups. And the group that is getting the imaginative kind of exercise practice at the end of the month, they come back and they report these experiences that the other crew, two groups didn't. Right. And you also, um, you, I, I was really fascinated. I remember you saying they scored better on certain tests. And I, I just want to uh, read from your book. You mentioned the tests were things like imagine a plus sign, um, add a vertical line to the left side, rotate the figure 90 degrees to the right. Now remove all the lines to the left of the vertical line. So nothing to do with religion, just mental imagery. Yeah. And people all of a sudden score better if they're in this, in this, um, this uh, specific practice group. Yeah, I mean, it's a slight change and to, for the effect to achieve significance, you have to add it to, you know, you have to look at another measure as well, which I think had to do with 
you know, having images come to mind. But yeah, you, you score a little bit. There, there seems to be something real about the. And the other thing you mentioned is that while obviously, therefore, the training kind of works, the other control groups don't have this experience. Um, the other thing that mattered is how high they had scored on the absorption scale at the at the start, right? That even if they had the training, if they're very low in the absorption scale, they're not. They don't make the same kind of progress, if I can call it that. Right. So we don't. I mean, if you were going to give a technical answer and say, is there a statistical interaction between absorption and training effects? We don't see that, but that's probably because there weren't enough subjects. So we did a version of this study, not a training study, but a kind of absorption. And we looked at the way people represented their mind. And we saw, and that was with a much larger number of subjects. And there, we really thought there should be a relationship, an interactive relationship. Can't quite see it, but again, that's probably the, the effect. I think there probably is a relationship. I think we, what you really do see in the data is that if you're low in absorption and you train, you don't get up to the top that the people who are high in absorption do. So it's more like a floor effect. Right, um, right. Combination of talent and training, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you, uh, you mentioned that the other thing is that, you know, so people learn to attend to their minds differently. And in so doing, they have these different experiences They develop a relationship. And the relationship changes them, right? Like you talk about the fact that there's just a lot of health benefits associated mm -hmm. with people who, who are able to have this kind of a relationship. Yes. So this is um, a really robust observation that, you know, there are all of these different studies. And this is not my, so it is true that my work found that uh, people who were, um, religion reduces your loneliness and kind of improves your well-being. And so my work contributes to this, but there's more that there's this army of researchers who study religion in all kinds of ways. And um, most of the big studies, you know, their measure of religion is, do you go to church or temple? You know, mm. or do you consider yourself a, a, like a, a person of faith? And it's like one question that's like big data set Right. And then they have umpteen measures of, you know, they might be interested in cardiovascular health. They might be interested in immune function. And it's, um, and there is typically, you know, you know, like this guy called Harold Koenig looks over over 3000, something like 3000 um, papers, around 3000 papers. Mm -hmm. And he finds that in around two thirds of them, there's a positive relationship between you know, somebody being religious and having some better health outcome. So there's a little bit of work about the relationship. And that little bit of work suggests that if you've got a good relationship, it's better for you. So you can be religious and have a lousy relationship with God. You know, you can treat, you can see God as this harsh judge. Well, that turns out not to be very good for your body in that, in that, in the work that's done in that field. Right. It's an actually <laughs> uh, negative experience. Uh, it has negative effects, essentially. Yeah, exactly. So I think that, that, you know, I think that you can argue, well, so I, I argue that one reason that faith is so resilient is that the work that you do to create this relationship with God is actually good for the body. And it was therapeutic, improves yeah. your immune function. Yeah. And I liked how you, you, you know, you drew an implication of that. You know, we talk about religion often as very cognitively as explaining reality, but you say it's more about yeah. transforming it. It's, it's relationship rather than explanation. Is that, is that fair? I think so. That it's, you know, I think we spend far too much time thinking about religion as belief. And it's, I don't want to say that belief is irrelevant, but um, it's, I don't think that people of faith are kind of mindless believers. They are. They certainly recognize the incoherence. You know, they're talking to this invisible mind. You know, God can do anything, but God, prayer often fails. I mean, it's, it's not like they're ignorant about that. It's, but it, but they they're doing all of this these activities to help them to hold the idea of a loving God or spirit 
um, present for them, salient to them. And the work to do that, I think, is probably in general, good for people. It pays off, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, we don't have much longer. Uh, Tanya, the last thing I want to mention is in your, your more recent book, How God Becomes Real, you, mm. you do a uh, cross, um, uh, cross-cultural and international uh, comparison. You, have, you compare Americans to uh, folks who are living in Ghana and other folks who are living in South mm. India. What did the international comparison show? Well, it showed me that um, absorption still matters. People who are higher in absorption are more likely to have these experiences. It showed me that there's a story about the way people model the mind. That there's, I thought that Americans had, had in general this sort of Charles Taylor model of the mind is bounded and separate from the world, like set aside from the world and looking, you know, thoughts are the source of your identity. You really have to share them. Um, because they're locked inside your mind otherwise. And in both in uh, Ghana and in uh, with in Accra and in Chennai, in West in Ghana and in South India, um, people thought about the mind pretty differently and they had a more vivid experience of God. And I thought that I could see that the Americans were likely to sort of second guess themselves and sort of diminish their experiences of God. And in, in Chennai, and particularly in Accra, people would uh, make God, sort of allow God to be as vivid as possible. Yeah. So there is this kind of interaction between the way people were thinking about um, the mind and the way they experienced God. Hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Dr. Lerman, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, as I say, I found your work really fascinating. And for everybody who's listening, uh, the, the two books are When God Talks Back and How God Becomes Real. Um, uh, Tanya, again, th thanks very much. I really appreciate having this chat with you. Thanks. You're a really good interviewer. And you, you, you understand the work. It's really lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.